So good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety of Korea, as well as the Korea Biomedicine Industry Association for giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, deliver a lecture on ICH E2BR3 guideline. I would have been delighted to be among you in a room in Korea, but we have to adapt to the situation and use uh, video conferencing. However, you must welcome to ask questions at the end of this lecture or to reach me later on by email. I would like to disclose that I am a full-time employee of Biopharma, not receiving compensation from ISOP, the International Society of Pharmacovigilance, not either from uh, EFPIA, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Association. Also, I would like to emphasize that the views expressed in this presentation are personal and do not necessarily reflect the views of Bayer, my employer, ISOP, EFPIA, and the organization of this meeting, nor any other institution I am collaborating with. When looking at the uh, XML file of uh, individual case safety reports in it to be R3 format, the immediate visual impression is that it's far more complicated than in uh, need to be R2 XML file. So why creating such a complex system, which took so many years to elaborate, by the way? There must have been some really good reasons for making it like it. This is why I will try to understand uh, these reasons during the upcoming 60 minutes. So this lecture will be composed of four parts. Part one will provide examples of the rationale for creating E2BR3. Part two will provide an overview of the E2BR3 data elements. Part three will explain using an example how E2BR3 works, mapping um, the date uh, from the data to the content of the XML file. And part four will introduce how E2BR3 was customized for Korea. So first part, rationale for creating E2BR3. Looking at the historical background, it started all in 1990 with the release by the Science One Working Group of the report on international reporting of adverse drug reaction. And this report included the Science One form, which is still in use in some countries to report suspected adverse drug reactions. In 1997, the first ICH E2B guideline was released on electronic submission of ICSRs. In 2001, a significant revision was released. It was initially named E2BM and subsequently renamed E2BR2. But this revision proved to be insufficient. So in 2005, started the revision for creating E2BR3. And it actually took 11 years till the release of the final version of E2BR3 guideline. Uh, however, the E2BR3 working group is still active. And one major uh, pending piece is the IDMP dictionary for drug substance and product which is part of the E2BR3 standards and which may take uh, several more years to be released. I will not insist so much on E2B, uh, as on the Medical Dictionary for Regulatory Activity, MEDRA, because you uh, had uh, quite a comprehensive presentation on this topic delivered yesterday. You know, there are five levels of term, and this dictionary exists in uh, 13 languages and a set of queries, the SMQs, have been developed to use the data. So please refer to the lectures you uh, had yesterday. 
The left part of the slide shows the science one form. And uh, to make it more readable, the items are listed on the right. If you will look at the items, the items marked with a green bullet need to be collected at the case level only. So for that, this form would be fine. However, all items marked with a bullet in red may need to be collected for several events and more than one suspected drug. So we are touching here one of the key drivers for creating E2BR3, which was the need to reiterate the recording of a number of data in a given case. And I will further elaborate on that on the following slides. You probably know well the four criteria which needs to be met for the definition of an individual case safety report, an identifiable patient, an identifiable product, an identifiable adverse event, and an identifiable reporter. But in fact, all but patient identifier may need to be repeated because they may be a co-reporter in addition to the reporter, there may be several events under scope in a given case, and there may be more than one suspected drug for a given event. As well for the seriousness criteria. For example, a given ICSR, uh, maybe uh, well, a given a adverse event in an ICSR may include both no, sorry, a given ICSR may include both serious and non-serious events. And uh, one may include several uh, events uh, serious for different reasons. Regarding causality assessment, the primary reporter, the market authorization holder, and the national regulatory authority may have different opinion on the causal relationship for the suspected drug and adverse events. For this reason, the causality should be repeatable. The collection of the causality should be repeatable. Moreover, because the primary reporter, the market authorization holder, the pharma company, and the national regulatory authorities may be using different methods for assessing the causality, the method used for the causality assessment should also be recorded in a repeatable manner. And because it is a most important aspect of case evaluation, I would like to give example of the different types of causality assessment methods. This method may be categorized in scoring methods, such as the Naranjo score, qualitative methods, such as the WUMC system, for standardized case causality assessment, and the so-called dichotomic methods, which are basically causally associated yes or no, based on the concept of a reasonable possibility of causal association, according to the sentence in the ICH E2A guideline. Scoring methods. The Naranjo method is based upon a series of 10 questions to be uh, responded. And depending upon question, the response yes may be scoring minus 1, plus 1, or plus 2. No may be scoring minus 1, 0, plus 1, or plus 2. While do not know or not done maps always with a score of 0. So finally, an overall score of zero maps to doubtful, one to four maps to possible, five to eight maps to probable, nine or above maps to definite. And this uh, scoring method is still uh, used. It's the preferred method um, by some experts still. The WHO causality assessment is more recent. It's a qualitative scale developed by the Uppsala Monitoring Center, which is a WHO, WHO collaborating center. And it was developed with a network of national centers participating in the WHO program for international drug monitoring. Uh, these methods include six categories defined by uh, selected criteria shown on this slide. And those categories are certain, 
likely, possible, unlikely, unclassified, which is to be used when uh, further information to clarify is awaited, and unclassified when uh, unclassifiable, sorry, when no conclusion can be established and no further information is expected. The principle of dichotomic causality assessment method is based upon the concept of reasonable possibility of causal association. This method is used as a standard in clinical trial where causality needs to be assessed on a yes-no manner to allow a clear-cut determination of suspected and expected serious adverse reaction, the SUSAR, which may require to break the code and reporting to the ethics committee. It is the method which is applied in Korea, not only for clinical trial case, but also for the ICSR reported from the post-approval phase. This method is also widely used by the industry because it's the most suitable for handling large amounts of ICSRs. So finally, as shown on this table, by including repeatable sections and data elements, E2BR3 makes possible to capture multiple events per case, multiple system suspected drug for each of the events, and multiple causality assessment for each uh, event drug combination. So we can now summarize some key advantages of uh, E2BR3 standard. So, uh, in summary, the key advantages include repeatable section uh, or repeatable data elements, per event evaluation compared to evaluation per case in E2BR2, capturing causality assessment from multiple evaluators, Medra Drug Dictionary, IDMP dictionary for substances and product names. In addition, E2BR3 is designed to include contents in native language. We'll see that later in the presentation. It allows for regional customization, which happened in Korea. And it can also embed source documents in multiple format <coughs> into the XML file itself. And that can be a PDF, that can be a Word document, and that can be images, including DICOM files. So it's quite powerful. Moreover, E2BR3 allows for coding the reason why a data is missing using the so-called null flavor concept, which I describe in the next slide. So the null flavor is a code which specify why a data is left empty. E2BR3 includes six null flavor codes, corresponding respectively, as shown on this table, to no information, masked, unknown, non-applicable, asked but unknown, and not asked. So after having understood the key reasons for developing E2BR3, these are examples, there may be more, let's focus on its overall architecture and core data elements. The implementation guide for electronic transmission of individual case safety reports describe the E2BR3 architecture, the data elements, and the message specification. E2BR3 core data elements are grouped according to seven sections. Section N, which has the data elements relative to ICSR transmission identification. Section C, which holds the data elements relative to the identification of case safety reports. Section D addresses patient characteristic. Section E, adverse events and reactions. Section F, the test procedures apply to the patient. 
Section G has the items related to drug information. And finally, Section H, which hosts the narrative case summary and further information. Interestingly, all seven sections include data elements which are repeatable as necessary. Those data elements are identifiable with a small r into their name. Moreover, the full section D related to events and the full section G related to drug information are fully repeatable. Section N, ICSR transmission identification, is not repeatable, but include items which are repeatable. It should be remarked that all items in this section are required to be filled, so-called mandatory items. The complete architecture of this section N is shown in the next slide. So these graphs which is extracted from the E2B R3 implementation guide, shows the full architecture of section N. The non-repeatable items are gathered in the upper box, while the repeatable or complex items are shown in one or more boxes below. So it's the same type of graph that the implementation guide shows for all sections. Section C includes five subsections. So C is identification of case safety reports. So five section C1, identification of the case safety reports, which include repeatable items. C2R, primary source of information, which is repeatable. The subsection is repeatable as necessary. Section, uh, subsection uh, C3, information on sender or case of case safety report. Subsection C4R, literature references. The subsection is repeatable as necessary. And finally, section, uh, subsection C5, study identification, which also includes data elements repeatable as necessary. So the all section C is not repeatable, but two subsections are repeatable and three other subsections include repeatable items. So there is a lot of repeatable in this section C, although it is not repeatable as a whole. So the complete architecture is shown in the next slide, and you see that it's already quite more complex. So this graph, uh, again, from the implementation guide, shows uh, the, the full architecture. The section five includes, the, the, you see, the five subsections. Uh, and altogether, those five uh, subsections include a total of 52 data elements, which include 23 repeatable. So as I mentioned, there is a lot of repeatable into it. Continuing with section C, I would like to emphasize the 12 data elements which are required to be filled, to call mandatory. Only one of them, the qualification of the primary reporter is repeatable, C2R4. Let's get to section D now, patient characteristics. So because a single ICSR refers to only one patient, the whole section doesn't need to be repeated. However, here also, some of its data elements are repeatable as necessary. So section D includes one single item required to be filled, it's patient identifier, information on medical records, patient demographics, uh, repeatable items relative to patient history and past drug history, and if applicable, cause of death and characteristic of the parents of the patient. However, this is a kind of summary. The full architecture is more complex due to numerous sub-items, which I'll show you in the next slide. So this graph, again, shows the complete architecture of section D as shown in the implementation guide. The upper box include the structurally simple items, whereas the subsequent boxes reflect the subsections, including data elements which are repeatable or which include 
uh, two component items, which are marked with one A and uh, one B. And it should be remarked that six of the subsections are repeatable as necessary, and moreover, include repeatable items. So by seeing this architecture, we, we understand the reason of the complexity of the structure of the uh, XML files in E2B R3. Let's get to section E, reactions, event. The whole section is repeatable as necessary in order to cope with multiple events. So it's included a total of uh, 20 data elements hosting event term as reported in the language of reporting, specification of the language of reporting, translation of the event term in English, MEDRA code of the reported event according to the primary reporter, MEDRA version used for the coding of the adverse event term, seriousness criteria, date of start and end of the reaction, duration of the reaction, whether the case is medically confirmed, the event is medically confirmed by a healthcare professional, and country where the reaction occurred. The uh, data, we are now in uh, section E again, uh, reaction event. So the data elements required to be filled are indicated in yellow, and we'll use this convention throughout this presentation. One of them is the MEDRA code for reaction and event. Let's get to section F now, result of test and procedure. The whole section F is not repeatable, however, all its items are repeatable. So it includes data element designed to host the test date, test name, med record of the test, MEDRA version used for the coding of the test name, test results including value, qualifier, code, units, test results in free text, normal range, comment and additional information, and none of those items is mandatory, which is logical because the, uh, doing some uh, additional procedures is not necessarily the case for an adverse event. Let's move to the big piece, section G, drag information. Because this section is the most complex of all, I would like to show first a simplified overview. The all section G is repeatable as necessary in order to cope with more than one suspected drag per event, which is logical. This section includes data elements relative to drug role category, could be suspected drug, concomitant drug, interacting drug, or not administered. Medicinal product identifier, pharmaceutical product identifier, Medicinal product as named by the primary reporter. Identify substance and strength. If it's clinical trial case, blinded or unblinded. Identification of the country of origin of the product. Name of the market authorization holder. Uh, number of the uh, registration number of the MIH. Uh, dosage information, which includes 19 sub-items cumulative dose to reaction, indication, action taken, and most important, the drag event matrix, which include 10 sub-items. So this graph shows the full section G architecture as presented in the implementation guide. And uh, I have squared in red these drag event reaction matrix. This table shows the first level of data element in section G, emphasizing the two mandatory items with flagged in yellow and the repeated one. And as you've seen, I'm flagging the repeatable items by writing them in red with a light brown background.
So this uh, section GK9I, this is the name of the drag event matrix, is reputable as necessary in order to host the causality assessment and the element for causality assessment for multiple events, multiple suspected drug, and multiple evaluators. So it includes data element hosting the assessment of causal relationship between the suspect drug and the reported event, the source of assessment, the method of assessment, the interval between the beginning of drug administration and reaction start with value and unit, the interval between last dose and reaction start, the reoccurrence of the event upon re-administration, which is the so-called re-challenge, which is a key element whenever available for the causality assessment. Combined with the event information, this subsection has the key element to establish the temporal relationship, which is a key element for establishing the causality. Let's get to the last section now, section H, narrative case summary and other information. It includes a total of five data elements, case narrative, which is the only mandatory item designed to receive free text and which is not repeatable, meaning that there should be only one per ICSR. Whereas the all other data elements are optional and repeatable. This include reporter's comment, free text also, the med record of the sender's diagnostic, or syndrome, or event reclassification, the sender's comment, again free text, and case summary in native language, free text again. A key point to consider is that for any event, section H, allows the market authorization holder, the sender of the case usually, to report a MEDRAC code differing from the code determined by the uh, adverse event term used by the primary reporter. It also allows the sender to provide a free text opinion on causality. And I will provide you with more details in the third part of this lecture because I will be taking this section H as an example. So the purpose of uh, this part three, data element definition to XML file, is to show you how data elements are defined in the E2B R3 implementation guide, mapped to the contents, and how contents appear in the XML file of the case. And as mentioned, for this mapping, we'll take the example of section H, narrative case summary, and other information. This table shows the totality of the data elements, including into section H. Uh, H1 is free text, mandatory, designed to host the description of the clinical course therapeutic measures, outcome, and additional relevant information. H2, free text, optional, has the reporter's comment, and this element is not repeatable. H3R, optional, repeatable, is designed to receive a med record differing from the code determined by the term applied by the primary reporter. So it may be a different diagnosis because the the company would not agree with the diagnosis made by the reporter, or a syndrome, uh, which the reporter may not have, uh, have uh, reported initially, or even a reclassification of the event. But if everything is fine, if there is a full agreement between the initial reporter and the company, uh, this uh, section doesn't need to be filled. As you can see in this table, H3R includes two components, the med record itself, which is named component 1B, whereas component 1A is the version of the MedRA dictionary 
use for cutting the content of one. H4 is free text, optional, designed to host a comment from the sender. Again, usually the market author is older. And this element is not repeatable. H5R is designed to host contents in native language, in the native language of reporting. And it is uh, optional and repeatable as necessary. This H5R includes two components, one A, A hosting the text content itself, whereas component 1B is configured to host the two or three ISO code uh, of the language of reporting. And whenever the 1A component is filled, the 1B component is required to be filled. So it's an example of conditional mandatory. This picture shows the summary of architecture of section H. So the upper box contains the non-repeatable elements H1, H2, and H4, whereas the two lower boxes contain H3R and H5R, which are repeatable as necessary. So again, H3R is the med record for the sender's diagnosis, and H5R the case summary in native language. This slide shows how the E2B R3 implementation guide provides details on how data elements should be configured. So those details include user guidance, conformance, data type, object identifier, value allowed, and business rules. For H1, the description specifies that filling the data element is required that it can include up to 100,000 alphanumeric character, that no object identifier is associated, that it's free text, and there is a business rule emphasizing that the purpose of H1 should not be confused with the purpose of H2, reporter's comment, or H4, sender's comment. For component 1A of, HR, of H3R, the description specified that it is required only if 1B is filled with a measure code. The version number may be up to four alphanumeric characters. There is no OID associated. And the value input should only include numbers and dots. And the business will specify how to deal with filling the item. For component 1B, the description specifies that it's required only if 1A is filled. Should be a digit code, the MEDRA code. It indicates the associated OID and specify that the content should be numeric only. And this representation with those boxes is a standard. It's not only for section H, it's for all uh, data elements uh, in the implementation guide, but uh, I am introducing this uh, presentation uh, only at this stage, but it's a general feature of the implementation guide. For H5R, the implementation guide explained that this data element is designed to host content in a language different from the language used in H1, H2, H4, and that the 1A and 1B components should be used in combination. For 1A, the content itself, the description specifies that filling the data element is optional, that it can include up to 100 alphanumeric characters, same as the H1 narrative, there is no uh, object identifier associated, it's free text. Whereas the 1B, the language code, specify that uh, the, it's required if 1A is filled. Uh, it uh, shows the ISO language code, up to three letters, the associated OID, and the uh, code for the language. And for Korean, it would be KOR. But now let's look at a real example. This table shows the content of the H section of a clinical trial case from the Netherlands, a real case. What we see is that H1, narrative, H2, reporter's comment, and H4, sender's comment, and H5 are filled. For H5R, it was, we see that it was not necessary to repeat the iteration more than once. Uh, but it would have been possible to, uh, to repeat uh, this section. 
H1 narrative refers to three reported terms, fever, diarrhea, eutropenia, which are, and it's actually the third one, eutropenia, which is considered as serious and unexpected. H2, the reporter's comment, includes the investigator's opinion that neutropenia is related to the study medication, and consistently, uh, H4, sender's comment, agree, um, including the company opinion that neutropenia was likely caused by the investigational medicine. H3R remains empty, which means that the market authorization holder or the applicant did not consider necessary to input any MEDRA term in addition to those determined on the basis of the term given by the investigator. H5R1A contains a narrative in Dutch, which include most but not all of the information contained in H1. It's better if it's actually uh, the same. Uh, H5R1B specified that the language of the content input into H5R1A and in this case, it is Dutch, the language spoken in the Netherlands. Let's see now how those narrative contents look like in the E2B R3 XML file of this particular clinical trial case from the Netherlands. For each of H1, narrative, H2, reporter's comment, H4, sender's comment, and H5, narrative in native language, the content found into the XML file of the case include the object identifier, the text content, which you see with the yellow background, and the name of the data element. And we see on the bottom one, uh, which is uh, H5R, NL, which specified the language. So they have used a two-letter code for the language Dutch. But uh, in this uh, picture, I went readily to the very location of those items in the XML file. So the issue, which may be a bit tricky, is to find them in the XML file. So this picture shows how the different, how to find the contents of H1 narrative from the root of the XML file of this city case from the Netherlands. As you can see, the order of the data elements is not necessarily the order stated in the overall E2B R3 architecture. And that's the point which is a bit tricky. So in this example, the H1 narrative is located readily after the C1 uh, H1 data element. So you need to get through the file. Uh, you can be held by the, the colors uh, and uh, look at the name of the data elements which you're familiar with, and then you find the content. I would like to mention that uh, the, um, the XML file uh, are openable by uh, HTML brothers. So you can, uh, you can open them uh, with uh, Firefox or uh, Safari or uh, uh, any kind of brother, HTML brother. But that would not open with, uh, with Word, for example. The purpose of the second and third part of this lecture was to get you familiar with the architecture of E2BR3, the configuration of the data elements, and how those elements map to the content of the XML file. In the last part, we will address how E2BR3 was uh, customized or adapted for Korea. So, a uh, little bit of background. Uh, particularity of E2B R3 compared to R2 is the possibility to create country-specific data elements. However, those elements should be created according to standardized rules. It is advisable, however, to minimize as much as possible the number of country-specific data elements because such deviations compared to the standard E2B R3 implementation guide implies to make country-specific configuration changes into the databases of the organization submitting ICSRs to regulatory authorities. So let's suppose that uh, 50 countries in the world would request country-specific 
uh, customization, the industry would face a very, very big problem. So whenever a national regulatory authority consider creating country-specific data element or customizing the allowed content and business rule of core data elements, then a regional E2BR3 implementation guide should be developed, which, uh, as experience proves, may take several years. It took a lot of time for developing one for Japan, for example. According to uh, ICH international practice, the elaboration of a regional implementation guide should involve not only the regulatory authorities, but also representatives from the pharma industry's concern. Uh, and again, because the industry needs to make uh, country-specific adaptation to their respective safety database. And uh, experience proved that um, pharma companies need to be given at least two years between the release of the final implementation guide and the date submission into the new system because mandatory. This is because uh, some of the changes uh, require intervention by the uh, IT company supplying the software, which may not be uh, necessarily uh, immediately reactive. Then they would need to issue a subsequent version, and then the subsequent version would need to be implemented into the system of the pharma company, which requires several months of validations and testing. So it's actually a heavy procedure. And this is something which uh, needs to be uh, understood uh, by the uh, regulatory uh, side. Getting to the content, Let's look at some essential features of E2BR3 for Korea. So first of all, the mandatory data elements are all included, which is essential. That's perfect. Second, all uh, the E2BR3 uh, core data elements corresponding to a med record are also included. This is, again, perfect. Um, and then let's get to the customization. There is a total of 14 Korea-specific data elements added to the core E2BR3 data elements. None of them is categorized mandatory. However, nine of those 14 items are so-called conditional mandatory, which means that those elements must be filled if some specific elements are filled. And for example, if it's a field that the case is from Korea, that it's domestic, then it becomes mandatory to fill uh, some, uh, uh, to fill those conditional mandatory items. In addition, the allowed values and business rules were customized for six mandatory core data elements. Regarding section N, ICSR transmission identification. No Korea specific data element was created, but the values allowed and business rule were adapted for two mandatory items, batch receiver identifier and message receiver identifier. Regarding section C, identification of ICSR, three Korea specific data elements were created. They are all optional reporter's qualification to host uh, HCP type, sender's type to host HCP type, um, and uh, for the study type where the reaction was observed to host additional study types which were not anticipated in the, uh, in the global uh, version. Still in section C, Values and business rule were adapted for four mandatory data elements, type of report, local criteria for rapid expedited reports, first sender of the case, and qualification of the reporter. In section D, patient's characteristics. Four courier specific data elements have been created, but they have been created actually to host drag names as reported and all are reputable as unconditional mandatory, which means that practically those elements need to be filled 
if the case is a domestic case from Korea. In section G, drug information, four Korea-specific data elements were created to host information on medicinal products and specify substance names. And here again, they are all repeatable and conditional mandatory. Still in section G, drug information, three Korea-specific data elements were created to host information on causality assessment. They are all repeatable, two are optional, one is conditional, is conditional mandatory to host the outcome of the causality assessment according to the CoRCT methods, which is a kind of associated yes-no, and this is requested to be filled for domestic cases. Uh, we should remark that it would actually be, would have been possible to address this Korean need by um, using repeatable core data elements. But the choice made by the Ministry on Food and Drug Safety was to make those uh, field more uh, readily identifiable by creating uh, Korea-specific elements which can be uh, seen immediately. Mapping wood drug codes to Ministry of Food Drug Safety drug codes. Um, as mentioned earlier, the uh, IDMP drug dictionary for drug substance and also drug products, which will be part of the E2BR3 standards, are not yet available. For decades and still currently, the WHO drug, um, uh, the uh, ICH standards for clinical trial case, is widely used also for post-authorization cases. In Korea, however, for domestic cases, it is required to input the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety drug code. So the implication of this requirement is that for submitting domestic cases to NEDRAG, all suspected and concomitant drug name would need to be recorded in a Korea-specific manner uh, compared to the would record used in the database of the market authorization order. So that was a big issue. So to address this issue, the EFPIA approached the UMC, the Ipsala Monitoring Center, asking them to design an automated tool capable of mapping wood records to Ministry of Food and Drug Safety's drug code. The UMC agreed, and we are very grateful, they agreed to create and maintain such a tool and received enough data to prepare a version for evaluation. In parallel, the Ministry on Food and Drug Safety of Korea, who joined this project, and we are also very grateful to the Ministry to have agreed to join this project, is gathering uh, English and Korean drug names for, from Korean company in order to forward this information to the UMC, who will incorporate those products into the who drive. The first production version of this automated mapper tool is intended to be released by March 2021. Afterward, it will be uh, updated and released uh, twice a year, like who drive. To conclude this fourth part of the lecture, I would like to make two recommendations, if I may to facilitate the implementation of NEDRAG from the 1st of June 2021. The first recommendation is to set up the verification rule for domestic cases, uh, like those for foreign cases, in order to let NEDRAG accept XML file configured for international submission and allow this until the end of the year. The, uh, the reason is that not all companies may be ready to uh, meet the requirements by the 1st of June, and it's safe to give a little bit more of buffer without delaying the start of uh, NEDRAG mandatory, and give uh, to the end of the year a little bit more time to those companies to adapt, and maybe they can uh, then resubmit the Korean names when they are ready. The second recommendation is to configure NEDRAG's uh, XML file uploading tool in order to make it accept zipped E2BR3 XML file 
until submission, an e-submission gateway configured according to the standard AS1 or AS2 or the new AS4 standards become available on the MFDS side. Uh, this is because some, uh, a lot of companies are using uh, software which does not have the um, batch generation capability in it to be R3. So those companies would need to uh, just zip the XML file and then uh, it would be good if the zip can be uh, uploaded uh, into the uh, uploading tool provided by the MSDF because this company may prefer to use the uploading tool rather than the, a gateway which is not according to the international standards at the moment. So I would like to conclude this lecture with the following remarks, emphasizing some of the key benefits of it to be R3 for the quality of ICSR. Compared to it to be R2, it to be R3 hosts ICSR information at a much, much higher level of details. It records the reason why elements may be left empty it allows for causality assessment differentiating the different suspected drugs. It enables recording the opinion of the reporter, sender, and uh, also as authority in a differentiated way. It includes a facility to host contents in native language in addition to English. It constitutes the ground for improving the quality of ICSR assessment, further improving the quality of the information collect and accordingly e2br3 is now nowadays the only ICH compliant standard for electronic submission of ICSR this is a decision from ICH to consider r2 as no longer ICH compliant and of course the using the SIAMS one form is not considered compliant either so we have now completed the full part of this lecture. I would like to thank you all for your attention and your questions are most welcome either now or you can also send them to me by email later on. Thank you very much for your attention.